Today, what I'm going to talk about was this part of this bigger project, which is an amazing constellation of political scientists, anthropologists, historians, uh, sociologists that are trying to see these peace movements as part of sociocultural history of these countries, but as part of this pan-European phenomena that was peace mobilization in the 1980s. In terms of sheer numbers, the mobilization was one of the biggest in the 20th century. So it deserves attention. It has been completely neglected in Southern Europe, which is not a surprise, but especially in Greece. So hopefully through this project with my colleagues, and especially uh, this presentation is part of an article I've co-written with uh, Dr. Dionysis Horhoulis, who, who is unable to be here, uh, and hopefully will give you an idea of why we're focusing on this as a topic, but also why we're quite obsessed with Andreas Papandreou. It's not an issue of political alignment, but just trying to understand his policy and why um, uh, that was quite popular. So. This is a quote from The Guardian in 1981, and, I, and, it, uh, and it goes, on the balcony, the primary soapbox of the Greek politician, his manner and his speech are transformed. He implants his feet in the stance of a prize fighter and slices the air with his hands, his heavy eyebrows drawing together, his voice mocking and indignant in turn. His rhetoric loses the careful moderation of his private conversation and crystallizes into slogans that touch Greek passions and are scrawled on walls all over the country. Greece for Greeks, out of NATO, change. And this was front uh, line, uh, was on the front cover of The Guardian commenting on PASOK's short uh, march to power in October 1981 when they won with overwhelming majority of almost 48% the elections and became government. Preoccupation with the tone and substance of Andreas Papandreou declarations was not just restricted to foreign observers, but also to Greek contemporaries and scholars of all political hues who struggled to decipher his words and respond to the lingering question of what really, that's in italics, drove his policies and what these policies were actually in practice. What we've tried to do here with my colleague, and this is part of a huge empirical research, is to propose that Andreas Papandreou attempted to combine and consciously fuse together different um, foreign policy fronts in what he dumped the policy of peace. And this is something that is part of the uh, manifesto of the party as well. Because Papandreou's rise to power, actually, in 1981, coincided with heightened Cold War tensions of the 1980s and the unfolding of the so-called Euro missile crisis. I'm not sure if you remember it. That completely took hold when the when the West decided to install uh, Euro missile pursing uh, and cruise missiles on uh, on, the, on the soil of five countries. That was Ger West Germany, Italy, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Italy. Therefore, it. The Euro missile crisis caused deep controversy across uh, Europe uh, about the deployment of this new generation of uh, delivery nuclear system. Therefore, against this background, when we talk about peace, politics of peace or peace uh, uh, strategies, either at elite or public opinion level, we tend to refer to nuclear or anti-nuclear politics. But that's one way of reading this, because ultimately what started to happen through our research through peace mobilization across Europe, but also in the case of Greece, it suddenly, peace politics became a shorthand for communicative and symbolic debates and contestation about the shape, form, and order of the political. In other words, because nobody of the generation of the 90s had endured nuclear annihilation. There was no nuclear holocaust, but there was a fear of nuclear holocaust. People were forced to imagine how it would, how it would, how it would take place if it happened. And, and that was so fascinating, and it's a window to society to really understand how they were interpreting this fear of a nuclear holocaust, of a nuclear winter, as the British used to call it. Therefore, to make sense of this peace policy and peace mobilization, what we've done as historians, we've adapted sociological uh, um, uh, conceptual frameworks, and the one is the most path-breaking is the one from David Snow, which is called framing processes. In other words, we're looking at how contrastive the contrastive process of meaning that percolates within this uh, movement for peace. And I quote here David Snow, who says, "The fear of nuclear holocaust is not immediately felt by the population. It has to made be it has to be made visible by the media and have to be defined, interpreted, and framed by politicians active." the press, and protesters themselves. So in Greece, going back, Papadreou tapped into, into this very diverse peace discourse that took place and framed the policy of peace in ardent nationalistic terms while subscribing to international cause. 
which was uh, the Euro missile crisis. So the scope of the policy of peace, and it's important to bear that in mind when we talk about it, and through my lecture here, was not solely therefore restricted to the discussion of nuclear armaments, but involved the negotiation of the American bases on Greek soil, relations with NATO, Balkan regional schemes for nuclear war or free zones, and international initiatives with the third world. But mostly, it was framed as a struggle against the perceived and real Turkish threat and the alleged American favoritism towards the latter and had a very relevant domestic angle because Papandreou himself was involved heavily in the neglected, albeit dynamic, peace movement. So a little bit about what we talk about this Euro missile crisis. In 1979, with the possible introduction of the neutron bomb and the 1979 NATO's double dual track decision, not only aggravated the fear of limited nuclear war in Europe, but significantly, significantly along with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, probably dealt the coup de grace and, uh, against the spirit of superpower detente. It meant the end of it and the beginning again of Cold War uh, antagonism. NATO's two drug decision, which was taken on the 12th of December 1979, actually meant providing the deployment of advanced new generation long range theater nuclear forces. There were around 108 Pershing missiles and around 464 ground launched cruise missiles in the five countries I mentioned. The decision it was a response to the SS 20s, which was uh, produced from the Soviet side. Uh, and it was a part, which I'm not going to go into detail, partly because it was very um, uh, kind of technical, uh, and I don't want to bore you. Uh, but, but it was a part of a very complex inter allied uh, negotiation process. As NATO adopted the 12 drug decision, what was happening in Greece? The conservative government, which was led by Kostadinos Karamalis, was uh, leading the country's smooth democratization process following the fall of the junta in the summer of 74, and had successfully negotiated by that point entry into the EEC as a full member. But it, it was mainly preoccupied with Greece's return to NATO's uh, military structure. If you remember, in August 74, uh, rapidly growing anti-Americanism and the humiliating consequences of the recent uh, double Turkish invasion in Cyprus pressured the newly then government installed by Karamalis to act. Greek Defense Minister Evangelos Averov, the military leadership, and eventually Konstantinos Karamalis all concluded that war with Turkey would be a very highly dangerous option as the seven years of the dictatorship had left the Greek armed forces into a fragile state. Instead of war, Karamanlis announced the country's withdrawal from NATO's integrated military structure and requested renegotiations of the future of USA based on Greek soil. And this was indicative of the phenomenon of anti-Americans, which I'm going to talk about at all. The, for, the fact that it forced a conservative a leader like Kostadinos Karamalis to make that decision to appease uh, what was a quite furious uh, uh, domestic public opinion about the perceived role of the United States during the dictatorship. So when the country left uh, the military command of NATO in August 74, it did not, however, withdraw from NATO's nuclear planning group. And the Americans did not remove the nuclear warheads that were deployed in Greece. At the same time, PASOK, which was newly created under the leadership of Papandreou, had become the main opposition party following the elections of November 74. PASOK's electoral rise had caused much apprehension to USA analysts and officials. We've gone through all of the major American uh, archives, and some of them even fearing, and I quote, by the time the first Carter administration completes its term, Greece could be a disaster area again. In why is that? Because in terms of declarations and before PASOK took power, in foreign policy at least, PASOK had stood first for an alignment based on hostility with Turkey, distrust of the United States, rejection of Greece's identification with the West, support of the Mediterranean socialist group, and closer links with the Arab world. Since 77, though Papandreou had started to moderate his rhetoric on his foreign policy goal. He had understood that his party would have to sift his foreign policy declarations to attract as much of the rapidly increasing lower middle, middle class voters and reassuring the Greek establishment, especially the military. But having said that, moderation did not mean that he did his electoral promises. Even in 1981, during the long electoral campaign, he was still promising to take Greece out of NATO, to close the USA base in the country, and to remove all nuclear warheads from the Greek territory. He also promised a referendum on Greece's membership that, of course, did not happen. But it's important to understand why these electoral promises 
were so much uh, believed by the by the public because Papandreou was exploiting very deep held popular frustration of what had been seen as Greece's subservience to the West, particularly the United States and Karaman kind of Lisi's new democracy perceived failure to curb foreign influence and make Greece's voice uh, heard properly on the world stage. Here we've taken from Eurobarometer uh, the three countries that we're looking from our research project, and it looks that if you see that. The question of anti-Americanism is usually asked uh, to rank your feelings of um, bad feelings towards the United States. For, so from seven to 10 of feeling uh, having bad feelings for the United States, Greece is really much an outlier in contrast to Italy and Spain, uh, which was undergoing also democratization and kind of a crisis when we refer to, the, uh, to Italy. And this is important to uh, understand because it wasn't just, of course, Greece was part of a, of a you know, general and, and kind of um, Western phenomena of, uh, of anti-Americanism that was exasperated by the advance of Reaganism. If you take this one of the posters, the world according to Ronald Reagan, you understand kind of the uh, critique that was uh, faced by different parts of the left, not just in Greece, of course, but in other countries about this new state of affairs that it was inaugurated by the election of Ronald Reagan. But what is interesting about the Greek case, at least in terms of, uh, despite cultural, uh, political, and ideological factors that have determined anti-Americanism during the post-war period, what was different in the post-war period was that the phenomenon was really embraced not just by the playing field of the um, uh, ultra-left, but the, the, the center-left as well. Therefore, what you have is that in anti-Americanism, therefore, in a way, transformed into a factor of national unity that superseded the Cold War consensus of the pre-Hunda years and offered a fertile ground for Andrea's ideas and policies. And the fact that it was propagated by the government itself really gave a different institutionalized form of anti-Americanism. And what is amazing about Greece, we are just starting to research this, and this is just one of the first findings, we, we are now trying to see the reasons behind it, is that anti-Americanism in the Greek case is very much related to pro-Sovietism. So a four-nation uh, study that was uh, conducted by Mavro Gordatos in 1985, they were comparing their four countries. One of the questions was from anti-Americans, people who had shown very strong negative feelings against the United States to express their sympathy towards the Soviet Union. You can see from their other countries there's no correlation. In Greece, on the other hand, there is a strong favor towards the Soviet Union the moment you are declaring yourself as an anti-American. And I think that kind of provides of a fertile grind to think about pro-Sovietism and anti-Americanism at the same time, seeing them as part of the same kind of uh, conceptual question. So when Pasok eventually won the elections in October 1981, the new prime minister, however, and his government were stuck between a rock and a hard place. Why that is? Because the post-74 nationalistic and populist rhetoric had significantly nurtured anti-American sentiment. Not that it was not there, but it definitely gave it a voice and a face. And it's true that Papandreou and his associate genuinely wished to break free from, the, from Greece's Cold War commitments. And during the 1980s, remained highly critical of especially the Reagan administration. The Greeks were also annoyed at the professed incessant insensitiveness of Washington to the pride and particular needs of its smallest allies like Greece. Furthermore, when we talk about Andreu himself, during his stay in the United States, he, saw he had been a left liberal who, had, who resented neoconservative USA-style capitalism and Washington policies around the world. However, Greek security interests required that the relationship between Greece and the United States and NATO no, could not be fundamentally altered to the short and medium term. In other words, Papandreou and his ministers, like the predecessors before him, the conservative ones, became painfully aware that Greece could not afford either to withdraw from NATO or break its relations with the United States for one overriding factor, Turkey. The Turkish threat not only dictated the country's foreign policy direction and considerable resources to defense, it also loomed large in the Greek public imagination. And I'm going to discuss this much more when I talk about the basis. But taking this from the World Bank, especially the Stockholm International Peace, the military expenditure in the 1980s almost surpassed 6.7% of the GDP in Greece. That was the second highest after the United States and much higher, you see, from Italy or Spain. This is a horrible picture. This is why historians should not do graphs. Um, but it just gives you an idea of how much this was 
capturing not just the imagination, but it was actually diverting Im immense part of resources towards defense spending because there was a threat that was credible in the eyes of the public. And Papa Andreou said that repeatedly when in a NATO meeting, he actually uh, said, and I quote, we really have a unique problem in Greece, which really you do not meet in any other country, member of the alliance. We sense a threat from an ally on our east, Turkey. And he pointed out that NATO was offering a guarantee against a Soviet attack from the north, even if there's no visible threat, when Greece needed and wanted a guarantee on our eastern frontiers. And what is Amazing, echoing of Andreu's words, Kostadinos Karamalis, when he met with the USA ambassador here in Athens, he mentioned, and I quote, you may not believe that we face the danger of a Turkish attack. You may not even believe that we face the danger of expanding Turkey's influence at our expense in the Aegean. All Greeks do believe these things, however, and because we believe them, you must take them into account. Therefore, referring to the sense of public mood. When Andres Maduro presented his government program to the parliament on the 22nd of November 1981, he implied that Greece might again withdraw from NATO's integrated military command as long as the alliance did not guarantee Greece's eastern borders. However, no explicit threat uh, was made to pull out of NATO altogether. In fact, he went on to carefully admit that, and I quote, the course of change will be a very long process. And that, with regard to the readjustment of Greek national security and foreign policy, the government will move on gradually, step by step, always taking into consideration all facts in order to secure the, ne the necessary military preparedness and might. Thus, the PASOK's government short-term foreign policy remained vague. How was he going to implement change, which was the main message of his electoral uh, victory, how that would happen gradually? Well, the answer was given to a reply to President Reagan's letter of congratulation, where Papandreou stressed that one of Greece's first duties would be, and this is, would come to a surprise, when he said, strengthening the USA-Greek ties in the interest of democracy, progress, and peace. But what he meant, he went to explain, such strengthening entailed actually in reality fortifying defenses against the Turkish threat, which were perceived as threatening to notions of peace and independence. In another contradictory manner, Papandreou was rejecting the Cold War straitjacket as it was imposed by the Americans, while at the same time willing to recruit their help in pursuit of the ultimate national interest, which was protection from Turkey. For him, both height and Cold War tensions and Turkey's aggressiveness posed a threat to peace. And echoing, echoing the sentiment, in mid-January 1982, Papandreou led a private meeting with the USA ambassador in Athens, Modiagl Stearns, where he stated that Greece wanted to remain in the Western alliance and the form of Greece's association with NATO was to be negotiated, but not the fact. When Stearns responded that his position was very much different from the PASOK program, Papandreou denied this, saying, and I quote, the PASOK program tried to define ultimate objectives rather than objectives that could be realized in short term. Even when pressured by journalist David Tong in the Times for his, for his first interview after his elections, he framed his coming to terms with reality with the following say, statement. As a socialist movement, we believe genuinely in detente and disarmament, and we're not prepared to accept as permanent arrangements the existence of two blocks, NATO and the Warsaw Pact. But the fundamental question for us is the Greek national interest. It is this and the current practical politics, not ultimate goals, vision, and targets, which we put before the Atlantic Alliance. No wonder, therefore, that the first NATO uh, defense meeting on 9th of December 1981, the Greek socialists blocked NATO's defense ministers from, from issuing a communique on their two-day meeting, highlighting the lack of satisfactory statement guaranteeing Greek integrity uh, against Turkey's aggression. NATO officials, because we've gone through the archives, evaluated this action as a product of Greek domestic politics, that there are, that, that, as an increased threat to the country's participation in the organization. But they also acknowledged that Greece, actually, the Greek action was a, store, a sorry step that hurt NATO's public image more than it harmed its actual functioning. The following day, Papandreou announced that Greece was proceeding to limit its military commitments within NATO and that the Hellenic armed forces will be only used in accordance with the national interest to face a, a, a possible Turkish threat. Uh, 
And it's very important that this tough strategy, in a way, rhetorically, at least speaking, was winning considerable support in Greece. The Greek public felt that the country had a leader who was standing up for Greek national interest. Papandreou himself declared while addressing PASOK MEPs in, in February 1982 that, and I quote, over the last three and a half months, Greece had made her presence felt in Europe and the Mediterranean. Indeed, by that time, PASOK had distanced itself from its NATO allies on the issue of Poland and had initiated what has been called the policy of footnoting in official NATO documents, which means that in every joint statement, we agreed, but then there was an asterisk where we actually said that we don't agree. Uh, so we, we gave our consent, but there was a footnote of our reservation on the topic. So in a way, what was, and I cannot re-express that because we have seen the documents much more frequently, but within these institutions, either it was the EEC or NATO, or when he was meeting bilaterally with, the, with these leaders, it was showing that Greece really, it was promoting this image of a small country that was standing up without though putting in peril the country's uh, supreme national interest, which was the protection uh, from, um, from Turkey. And it was during you know, this policy of dissent in a way, which was very kind of widely captured by the foreign press, and of course the domestic press was repeating it again and again and kind of reaffirming the sense of independence. But Andreu at the same time was very quietly dropping the issues of unilateral remov or removal of nuclear warheads from Greece uh, and in initiating other initiatives on the Balkans, uh, which I, I have not so much time to talk about, but I'm happy to discuss it during a q and and as well on issues of the initiative of the six, uh, which had to do with the, uh, with the other countries of the third world. So why is this important to understand is that no matter how irritating a lot of his initiative was, like blocking NATO decisions or always uh, you know, expressing dissent with NATO decisions, or even when he uh, proposed uh, to delay the, inst the installment of Euro missiles for six months, which really angered his NATO uh, allies, he was able to protect himself and his country as, as sincere advocates of peace and as independent actors without essentially risking any real confrontation with his NATO allies. But what was the biggest issue that he needed to, to kind of prove his point and have the public behind him, be, behind him was the issue of the USA basis. Because when we talk about peace politics and when we talk about peace mobilization in Greece, the main object of uh, discussion was the American basis uh, on the Greek soil. Just a little background, in 1943, since then, Greece has hosted four major USA bases and, of course, several other facilities. When Andres Papandreou came to power, and despite the electoral pledges for removal of the bases, he did start negotiating a new agreement uh, on the issue of the bases and USA military assistance. By the spring of 1982, both the USA administration and PASO government were trying to embark on negotiation on several outstanding problems. In May 82, actually, the Secretary of State, Alexander Haig, arrived in Athens for talks, with a few days earlier from Andreu having acknowledged that despite past and current grievances, and I quote, we must bear in mind the strategic fact which prevail in conjunction with our national problems, and the, defense, and the demands of our national defense. This also applies to, the, applies to the USA military base in Greece. However, Haig actually, when he came to Athens, he found 30,000 30, demonstrators waving banners and flags out with the Americans, out with the basis of death, Haig go home as they gather near the parliament to protest at the visit. This, this was one of the many, many peace movements that took place in Athens. From the European protest data, which is a fantastic uh, commission-led project, which actually registers all of the protests that took place in Southern Europe from 98 until 1985, you can see that the issue of targeting the United States, either that was American bases or, in, or uh, the affiliation or Greek American military assi assistance, this is the number of protests that were taking place. They escalate in the period of 1983-1984. This was when the discussion of the bases was up for discussion. And it's important to understand because actual Greek peace movements turned out to be one of the most vibrant within Europe. Just indicatively, in November 1983, almost 400,000 protesters went out in Athens to protest on the issue of American bases. And there are many, many reasons to explain that, and, it have, and it's not only to do with Andreas Papandreou, but what, what was the political climate in Greece. 
This is a question of what is your political involvement in your respective country from the Eurobarometer. Political involvement is very broadly conceived. It can be from being part of a party or going out on a protest, but it shows this, the, the level of politicization. Look at Greece as being an outlier in the 1980s with the, with the, with the rest of the, of the Western and Southern European countries. This pretty much explains the level of mobilization that was taking place during this period. And I think it's an important kind of factor to, uh, to include when we're trying to explain uh, why Vandere was initiating these policies and why they came up with such um, acceptance. So, who, are, who, who was involved in this peace mobilization and how much were part of PASOK or other political parties? Where there were three major peace movements in Greece uh, that we, some of them are well, very, very well known, some not so much. But what is interesting for all three of them, and I'm missing another one which I'm going to explain why, Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on who you're asking, they're all affiliated with the party. What you have in Greece is that the parties are actually organizing these peace movements. These peace movements did not come out of thin air. They were pretty much directed by the parties themselves, but it, they did incorporate a huge, uh, a very small, a very um, large number of protesters. So the first one was EDIE. This was uh, associated with the, uh, with the Communist Party as we say it. Uh, and this was, of course, had a long uh, tradition from the 50s and the 60s. It was part of the communist-led World Peace Council. And despite declarations of non-partnership, the movement was led by the Greek communist, which remained loyal to the Soviet Union. As a consequence, EVA used to blame the United States for the escalation of the nuclear arms race. In the summer, how, therefore, that was creating a huge problem, because in the summer of 1981, some of the members of EVA, with a prominent nuclear scientist and, and PASOK's later MEP, Christos Markopoulos, at its helm, had decided to leave uh, EDA and form a new pacifist movement, which would be under, uh, with the support of PASOK, which was called KEADEA. The founders of KEADEA had really felt that EDA's peace mobilization uh, really had uh, been essentially Soviet friendly. So, and such affiliation had proved a weakness for several, three basic reasons. First, according to them, it falsified the character of the movement, discouraging many people from mobilizing against the nuclear weapons because it, simply they were refusing to subscribe to pro-American or a pro-Soviet point of view. Secondly, the superpower rivalry that was taking place and the escalation of armaments, which was really unprecedented in the 1980s, reinforced within society, and this is not just Greece, this is across Europe, this sense of urgency, unease, and fear. So therefore, the society was demanding that the peace effort was directed towards both superpowers. And third, and barely discussed in public, of course, PASOK's decision to establish a separate peace movement constituted an attempt to create an anti-nuclear movement, which seemed to be so popular among people, that it was free from the control of the Communist Party. This aim, therefore, was to create another PASOK-led movement with centers in all major cities that would overturn the communist dominance in, of the Greek peace movement. But Vandreou, at the time, was still the leader of the position, completely and actively embraced the creation of Kiavea in the summer of 81, saying, and I quote, for the Greek people, the issue of peace acquires a special meaning. We are hosting the American military bases as well as nuclear weapons. We are acquisitions of the right. At the same time, we're facing Attila in Cyprus and the expansionary policies of Turkey in the Aegean. This is very important and kind of highlights exactly how from early on the peace movement, especially Andreas Padreou, who became kind of the media icon for the, for the mobilization, really negotiated the terms of peace along nationalistic purposes an attack on the right and highlighting that the major enemy was not, not on the other side of the Iron Curtain, but on the other side of the Aegean, which was Turkey. So how did one of those anti-nuclear initiatives, the, one, the policy of dissent and backing and uh, hosting one of the most vibrant uh, peace movements, fit in his broader foreign and domestic goals of peace? First and foremost, Papandreou genuinely seemed to believe that major victims of heightened Cold War tension were actually smaller states. 
This was the state that had no say at the table, but were actually would be the victims of any limited or full-on uh, nuclear war. And actually, peace initiatives, as the one he was proposing, were said to overcome Cold War divisions and thus protect the country's national interest. And he was not alone in this. Olaf Palmen from Sweden shared the same ideas. Trudeau from Canada also had this peace initiative coming on. He was one of the major other leaders, a chorus of leaders that were felt that they were victims of this Cold War uh, game. So in 1980, actually, he stated that nuclear weapons, and I quote, contributed exactly zero to our national defense, exactly zero. Yet there were other parameters at play. Andrea Similitano's active support of the anti-nuclear movement, both in Greece and abroad, was among other things a mean to satisfy the anti-American appetite of the Greek public in a way that would not undermine the country's web of Western alliances and hence put and imperil the Greek Turkey's uh, regional balance. But Andreu's peace initiative and his government's heavy involvement in the peace mobilization was linked to his desire to bolster the country's quest for independence, however, without posing a threat to its security, whilst adding the country's voice to international calls for disarmament and relaxation of tensions. His aim, therefore, was to put Greece on the map by playing the troublemaker, or for what he thought of himself, the peacemaker. And this policy had an amazing also key domestic dividend, which was that by creating and actively engaging in peace mobilization, he was mollifying the Communist Party in opposing USA aggressiveness. Suddenly, it wasn't the Communist Party, that Pas but PASOK, as, uh, uh, establishing itself as a hegemonic party of the left, that was really trying to dominate what used to be uh, in the terrain of the Communist Party, the, the cause of peace. And they started to get really worried by 1982, when, uh, with, with, the, with Kukwe's growing influence in the elections, for example, the municipal elections of October 1982. As the British Embassy was reporting from Athens, and I quote, the disappointment at PASOK's lack of progress in implementing change and at time going off with pre-electoral commitments has caused PASOK a relative poor performance. Moreover, moreover the radical party uh, members and supporters were expressing grassroots impatience at the slow pace of centrally directed change. So Papandreou, and the embassy concludes, were, was forced by 1982 to really steer a very careful balance between the left and the center. Therefore, outbursts of anti-American, ultranational, you can see here it says murderers of people, the Americans out with the basis of death. And this is, I think, the one that is in November 1983, where almost uh, less than half a million were actually um, uh, around the center of Athens. Uh, it was, what it was able to do was mobilizing public opinion, and you could see that from the public attitudes towards the United States, but also it silenced the left-wing critiques within his party and appeased the Communist Party. Therefore, this new type of mass public mobilization allowed for further influence of the masses through another PASOK-led organization, which was KADEA. In a way, PASOK was able to maintain its anti-imperialist message, anti-establishment and anti-Americanism, while beating the stigma of communism, and thus attract large segments of the population. The high level of peace mobilization and his government's endorsement boosted Papandreou's credibility in his attempts to launch all the other international and regional initiatives for, for peace. But most importantly, the mass peace movement added legitimacy to the claims of an independent voice in foreign affairs, transcending Cold War barriers and escaping American dominance, even when Papandreou was negotiating and concluding an agreement on the basis in 1983. And I'll give you an example. In summer of 1983, the USA and Greek governments reached an agreement on the basis. You would think that the reaction would be huge disappointment. No, people were out on the streets celebrating about the end, as they call it, of the dictatorship, of the American dictatorship. And this kind of posed the question to us how they were able to achieve that. First of all, therefore, that's why framing is so important. If you go through the press, which we have in our project, you will see an exp a, a, a framing of reality which is very different. So the basis, while they are being negotiated and being concluded, it is presented to the public as the beginning of the end. And I'll give you some quotes just to give you an example. Talking to the reporters as Andreas left, uh, Papandreou left uh, the negotiating table with the Americans, he was beaming with pride 
saying, and I quote, the defense agreement with the United States recognizes for the first time our country on equal footing and reflects to a large degree our hard-won national independence. Papa Andreou went further on to dump the agreement as a stunde nul moment, a break from the past, a break with the Greece's dark and dependent past as it was echoed in the agreement of 1953. Therefore, the Greek government presented it as a timetable for the removal of bases, not as another renewal of the bases. And this is very interesting because there was a huge wor uh, wordplay in the actual uh, agreement in 1983. The text says in English that the Greek bases are going to be terminable after five years. The Greeks uh, translate that in the Greek newspaper as terminated in five years' time. Therefore, there was a huge wordplay around how you're going to present to the public. But what is important for us is that actually, if you go through the peace mobilization, the press, their own declarations, most of the peace activists wholeheartedly embraced the logic. What you had were people dancing at Sidoma Square, saying, at last, the end of the dependence, our struggle has been vindicated. To make things even more absurd, during a parliamentary debate to ratify the agreement of removal, which wasn't really a removal, the bases were renewed again in 1988. Well, in October 1983, it is extraordinary because we've gone through all the parliamentary debates, how the majority of parliamentarians from almost all parties alluded repeatedly to the USA Greek defense agreement as part of the development of the Euro missile crisis that was taking place across Europe and the intense pan-European peace mobilization. Indeed, the PASOK MPs, at least, reverted again and again to the passwords of national independence, but significantly underlined the defensive character of the bases that guaranteed the peaceful policy of Greece during the Middle East, as they supposedly could not be used against any military campaigns in the region. The Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Yanis Kapsis, who had actually negotiated the agreement, noted, and I quote, Previous agreements resembled a prenuptial agreement for a happy marriage with the Americans. In contrast, our agreement bears the characteristic of a negotiated settlement following the filing of divorce proceedings. Let alone MPs went crazy for that phrase. And along the same line, other minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs underlined the completely different nature of the agreement. He declared that in contrast to past practices of striking deals behind closed doors and secret protocols, these new defense agreements were openly negotiated to the Greek public. He said this was a victory for democracy, really kind of reflecting and talking to that peace uh, protesters across Greece, but also in other countries of Southern Europe, they were asking for more democratization. They were asking for more control over foreign policy. And it was very interesting how they were echoing, at least rhetorically, this sentiment. Of course, parties of the opposition considered that the current agreement did not bind, did not bind the Greek parliament in 1982 to remove the, the, the basis. Hence, lamented PASOK for negating its electoral promises and transposing the heavy load of the decision to the next government. But for PASOK, this was a victory, not only because, as Papandreou said, it was a moment of national independence, but as he said, and this was in Parliament, and I quote, it provided peace in the, short, in the short and distant future. In the short term, it strengthened Greece's defense capabilities against possible Turkish aggression, while in the long term, it guaranteed the country's removal uh, as a possible site of Cold War confrontation. So what conclusions can we take from this kind of complex uh, story. Greece, still sober from the experiences of its brutal dictatorship and the double Turkish invasion of Cyprus, became less and less and less convinced by the incessant gesturing towards this ubiquitous shadow of an endless crisis that the Cold War fostered, and highlighted the need to reduce over-dependence on the United States. Most significantly, the political establishment and mass political opinion saw in Turkey, not, in, not across the Iron Curtain, the preeminent th threat to the country's security. I know that there is a new volume where Stefanidis claims the same, but in a way, the Cold War had ended for Greece by the 1980s. Therefore, the fall of superpower detente, the exasperation of tensions surrounding the Euro missile crisis, and the consequent rise of nuclear future fear 
further contributed to delegitimizing this Cold War division in the Greek public scene and strengthened this need for independence and national pride. And it's important to remember that that was before Andreas Papandreou. This was in Metapolitevsi after 74. And it was against this background that Andreas Papandreou rose to power and formulated the country's foreign policy. He was a product of his time, but at the same time, he heavily framed a version of Greek reality, a version of the actual reality, that struck an emotional chord and became a rallying point for the majority of Greeks. This version, beset with an ardently nationalistic rhetoric that required foreign scapegoats, was made believable because, as Mark Bartley has said on his seminal work on human rights, the conditions of possibility that had produced Greece's burning quest for independence had reached unprecedented heights by the 1980s. In the name of Greek nationalism, Andreas Pamandreou had promised his voters change in many facets of societal life, but also the country's foreign policy orientation. But as I've tried to solve, the Turkish threat meant that pragmatically he could not deviate from his predecessor's policy of utilizing Western fora to guarantee a delicate balance with Greece's Aegean neighbor. Despite his condemnation of Cold War dilemmas and American imperialism, peace for his country, and that's important, he uses this term again and again, peace for his country meant continuing relations with, with both NATO and the United States even when he was occasionally overdoing it by decrying the United States and Western institutions such as NATO, the EEC. But Andreu was aware that extreme courses in foreign policy were prove, could prove counterproductive and dangerous. The Greek government's actions and, argu and reservations arguably did little, if actually any practical damage to the West and arguably to Greece itself. These restraints, however, did not deter Papandreou from delivering his anti-American and anti-establishment message, and giving the Greeks the strong, independent voice they had been yearning for. When an interviewer, when I asked a uh, an protester, how did you feel when he, when he signed the agreement again in 1983, he said, I didn't care about the result. At least our voice was heard for the first time. And this was echoing other people who have been interviewed from our team the past months. So for him, who was the icon of this peace mobilization. And I'm not saying he was representing every voice, but he was the go figure when, uh, when referring to the mobilization. Such a policy was not contradictory to his proclamations, but part and parcel of fighting for peace. Ultim ultimately, Papandreou was guaranteeing peace for his, for his country in strictly nationalistic terms, but at the same time, he was promoting an international peace cause that was elevating Greece's status. He was neither a troublemaker, his opponents claimed, or a steer maker, as his allies would suggest, but his own brand of a peacemaker. Thank you so much.